26 years old, I was playing poker with the chairperson of one of the largest banks in the city. He gave me advice, two pieces of advice, that his father, who was a pullman on, a, on the Amtrak train for 40 some odd years, and he said, one, it's okay to be broke, and it's okay to be old. Just don't be both at the same time. Don't let that whole conservative Wall Street business tycoon CNBC thing throw you off. This is a bad, bad man right here. Thank you, Grant. Yeah, and, and, and I'm so excited to have you here, okay? I've been watching you on TV for, I don't know, how, how long you been on CNBC? 15 I'm, years or so. Yeah, so I've been watching him. I'm like, man, there's a guy, man, there's a guy making moves. Who is he? So if you've never researched this man, if you don't know his story, you're about to hear it. It is the American dream. I, thank you. And I definitely do believe that the American dream is accessible for all of us. Yeah. And, and so, Don, I, I, you know, here, here it is a Sunday. Your wife's backstage. She's beautiful. She's actually right there. Where's, where's Katrina? Oh, my God. Stand up. Look at this. This is pure elegance. Look at this, huh? If you guys need an interior designer, we're not, I'm not it. She is, okay? She's amazing. So, Wife, mother, and a business associate and partner for 30 years. And, and Don, what you and I have in common is business and real estate, okay? You want to just tell everybody what you've done with real estate? Like, how big's the People's Corporation and the Empire, and how much real estate do you guys own? Well, the People's Corporation, I started it in 1983 when I was 23 years old. At 26, we started our first building, which was about uh, $10 million back then. Today, our company's pipeline is over $4 billion, including our downtown Los Angeles project called Angels Landing. is $1.6 billion. $4 billion, please. Goddamn, eat your Cheerios. I think... I think it's important to also know I started that company with $600. Black man, 600 bucks, $4 billion worth of real estate. That should crash all your limitations. And just to kind of finish up about the introduction, back in, was it 2007? I think Forbes estimated my net worth at $700 million. Hopefully I've made some progress since then. So uh, chances are. So, uh, I mean, what it shows is that anything is possible. So, and, yeah, so, and we're back there, like, because the net worth thing, I mean, like, like, who checks that every day? Like, you don't, right? I have no idea. And, yeah. and my, Katrina and I joke about it. And uh, one, I don't really count. And I get briefed once a month financially about, you know, cash and where our projects are. But it's about every year. Katrina every now and then said, when she has to sign these tax returns, says, oh, wow, did we make that much money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but then there are years that are up and down, as they always are. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, but I have no idea today as I sit here what my net worth is. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's more important, cash flow or net worth? I think both. I mean, at a certain if you, point. If, if you had to pick one, you were 26 years old again coming up, what would you want? Cash flow. And I got, I got the benefit, there was a very, a, I got the benefit of being mentored by some top entrepreneurs and business people. I grew up in Washington, D.C. And I used to play, D.C., that's right. Give it up for D.C. And at 26 years old, I was playing poker with the chairperson of one of the largest banks in the city, the mayor of the city, and several business people. And there was one in particular who was a lawyer but made most of his money in investing in real estate and other things. And he told me um, the story or uh, he gave me advice, two pieces of advice, that his father, who was a pullman on, a, on the Amtrak train for 40 some odd years, and he said, one, it's okay to be broke and it's okay to be old. Just don't be both at the same time. <laughs> but, but the second one, and the most powerful one, was your money can work harder than you can. Mm, mm. It doesn't get sick, doesn't take vacations, doesn't get its heart broke. It 
Just keep on working. So while you're asleep or you're on vacation, your money will work harder than you. And that's what Grant's talking about, about cash flow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and look, you weren't always rich, well-dressed, and so articulate. <laughs> no, I wasn't. So, tell, tell them about where you came from. What were your first jobs? So first of all, I, um, I'm an unlikely example of any kind of success, but I'm an American story. So my father grew up in the segregated South in Southern Virginia. And my grandfather, who I'm named after, was a janitor in a public school system where my father and my aunts could not attend the school. Um, and my mother, um, my grandfather, who was a big inspiration to me, was a hotel doorman for 40 years. But both of them had a firm belief of the great opportunity that America offered. And so they instilled that in their children, and they instilled it in me. And a work ethic, be willing to work for what you want. So my first job um, was working, pumping gas at 13 years old. Um, and I did that at a gas station. My second job was a, a janitor on the janitorial crew um, uh, uh, for dental offices, an orthodontist to be exact. And so they had carpet like this and all the wires. And so I had to pick up the wires up every night. And so I learned, you know, the value of hard work. And then fortunately, by the time I was 16, my mother arranged for me to get a job on Capitol Hill as a page, which was a messenger on the House of Representatives floor. So I got a six-month term there. So you went to high school on the top floor of the Library of Congress. The congressional reading room was your school library, and you ate in the dining room of the uh, Library of Congress and had lunch in the House of Representatives dining room. So really impressive stuff. And so after, as I was there, I realized I was only going to be there for six months. So I made relationships with several Congress members um, who, are, who became lifelong friends. Um, and I got wow. jobs with them. And, uh, and then ultimately later on in life, I helped you know, raise money for them and, and uh, their campaigns and so forth. But that was the beginning of one, learning how to dress like this, because it was a blue suit white shirt, that was the uniform for pages, short hair, clean shaven. That's how I learned to dress like that. And then um, that's I- That's your deal, that's your deal. That's every, me. Yeah. And then I learned um, that uh, one of the most important things, the most valuable, one of the most valuable commodities is our time. Second most valuable commodity is the relationships we build mm. and that we maintain. How big of an influence, you being 16 years old and a page and, and with politicians that are pretty buttoned up, I, I would expect, maybe not. I don't I, know. You know them different than I know. I mean, it was very interesting. So, for example, and it became the platform of my business, ultimately. So, I graduated high school. So, graduation day was the morning my grandfather, my mother, my, so my grandfather, my parents, and a few close relatives we went over to the Rose Garden of the White House, and there, wow. President Carter handed me a certificate of achievement for high school, while the Vice President Walter Mondale looked on. And then from there, and from there, and by the way, I want to stop for a second, because coming over here this morning, I told that story to my wife, and I said, you know that I have met with every President of the United States since then and most of them have been in our house. And she said, well, that's really not a big deal. Um, that is a big deal. She said, most people don't see politics like you do. And I said, no, that's a big deal. The leader of the free world, I've met and helped most of them get their jobs. So, and that's who you're with this morning. <laughs> so, so how important, like, how important is that for a young kid, 16? I, I, you know, my dad died when I was 10, so I didn't have the mentors. Like, and I know it would have been different for me. Well, look, I think that was why my mother um, wanted me to become a page. One, I had an interest in politics, and she thought that was not the field that I should pursue. I should pursue creating wealth. And uh, so she wanted me to see it up close. But also, as an African-American young boy growing up in the 1960s and 70s, there were fewer role models. And my dad was not the role model she had in mind for me. And so, and my parents were divorced when I was five years old, so my mother was a breadwinner in our family. So being able to see powerful African Americans like Charlie Rangel, John Conyers, Vernon Jordan, and so many others leading our nation, 
um, showed me something very different, showed me that there was no limit to what I could dream of and do, and that how the President of the United States was courting and calling when I worked in Congress, because I stayed there all my last two years of high school. I had six months, but I got to stay there the whole time based on the relationships I formulated. And, and so, as, so the result of that, I got a chance to meet these people and see the President of the United States calling them for support. And so I, and businesses like the CEO of Ford Motor Company or Chrysler, Lee Iacocca, coming in to see John Conyers in his office in Washington, D.C. So I said, okay, holla, I may not have any money, but I'm going to have some relationships, mm. and those relationships are going to help me make money because access to power, access to those who appropriate money, I figure I can figure out how to make money from that. So, so what would you tell us about getting in the room, oh, getting, getting in that space, get, meeting these people. Like, because nobody told me to do that. Don't, they told me to go to school, get a degree, get a job, and nobody said, hey, go do what, borrow money to connect. What I learned in politics, again, was the way to build relationships with networking, being in the room like this, there, where you're going to find like-minded people like yourself. You're going to get valuable information that is generally not accessible. You're going to be around other successful, hard-driving people because you can never fly like an eagle hanging around Turkey. So you got to be in the room, right, with people who want to get there with you. So that, I cannot overemphasize that. That is the most important element of my success, other than, of course, the willingness to work hard, the willingness to be a student of my business, um, and thinking big like 10X. Okay. What, what does 10X mean to you? So having big dreams. I mean, dare to dream, right? So it is, when, when we all are younger, we all have big dreams. And what happens is society extinguishes those dreams. And by the way, some well-intended people, teachers, counselors, friends, and of course parents, relatives, they all are trying to, protect you in some degree. And then, of course, there's the haters who don't want anybody to be successful, right? But you've got to ignore them. Some, you've got to be willing to think big. So when I was, uh, when I was, uh, uh, when I was in high school, my uh, yearbook page said I was going to become a doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, and then invest in real estate to become rich. And my uncle was a doctor, so I wanted to emulate him. You wanted to get rich. You wanted, wanted to, to be rich. Absolutely. You had that as a target. No question. I mean, this is, a, this is a capitalistic democracy. We're not China, right? All right? And, and by the way, don't think that they're not rich people in China. It's just not accepted. This democracy is capitalism. So it's OK to want to be rich. Now, doesn't make you a better person than somebody who doesn't. But if you, the beauty of this country is you can go as far as your dreams, hard work, and good fortune are, willing to, are able to take you. And so I big, I'm a big believer in that. So what 10X means to me is that after that, I went to college. In my first year, I, had a, I went to Rutgers Newark because they had a six-year medical program, and it was close to New York City. L listen to this. Listen to this story. And so I had started... Right when I was visiting Rutgers once, um, and my aunt was, and uncle were living in New Jersey, I went into New York City. And this is a really true story here. So I went into New York City. My, my aunt said, you should drive into New York City. Take the car, drive into New York City. And I said, OK. Um, and so I went into New York City by myself. And I asked around, where is the hottest nightclub? Because by that point, I was you know, in DC going, sneaking into nightclubs, and I was six foot three, so I could get into pretty much anywhere. And I had this congressional ID card that said staff aid and didn't have a date of birth on it. So I could get into pretty much any place in DC. So I go up, so everybody says Studio 54, that's the place to go. I said, okay, I'm going there. So I park, I go to Studio 54, there's a big army of people outside. And there was an owner of the place, a guy named Steve Rubel, and these bouncers standing out there picking people. So I go up to Steve and I say, hey, I'm Don Peebles. Um, what does it take to get in? Well, how do you get in here? He says, oh, who are you with? And I said, just me. He said, oh, come on in. He 
he introduced himself. He said, whenever you want to come here, you let me know. And uh, so I went in, had a blast, saw all these celebrities. And I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm attracted to uh, beautiful women at the time, given my wife there. So I said, all these beautiful women, and this is great. And this is like a blast. So I liked it, and I started going there regularly before I graduated high school. So I was spending my money that I was earning on Capitol Hill to head to New York. So um, after I did that, and I did that through my first year at Rutgers. And after the, like kind of halfway through, I'm taking a political science class, and the professor is lecturing about how the law is passed. And so he opens it up for discussion, and I start telling him, well, actually, you're a little wrong on this. Here's how it works in real, the real world. They're not sitting up there debating and so forth. The issue is decided before a debate takes place. So there's no way, et cetera. So after that, I left that class, and I said, if this guy doesn't know any better than that, and this is who's teaching politics, I can't imagine anybody in business school teaching me that, and I'm done with medicine because I need more money to live the lifestyle I saw in New York City. I'm going to need a whole lot more money faster. So, so Studio 54 was good for something. Very good. And it told me, and it told me, I, I said, I want to have, I started having these bigger dreams then, and the girl I ended up dating was a New Yorker, and I started dating models and girls from New York. I started thinking about, okay, I want to have the red Ferrari when I'm in my 20s, not in my 50s or 60s. I want to have a nice house. I want to have a cool apartment. I want all that before I get married. And so I said, I'm going to be a millionaire before, uh, for, um, before I'm 30, and I'm going to have a million dollars for every year I'm alive by the time I'm 30. And I didn't, and, and so. Um, and, and at that time, what did you have? At that point in time, I had a, maybe a couple thousand dollars in the bank. Yeah. And no college so, education. So what are you doing, Don? Are you just like, you're like, you're like visualizing it, you're, you're talking to yourself, you're, you're writing it down, what, what, what's going on? I'm meeting people in the mix of things. And one of the other things is that I wanted to assess what success looked like, who, were, what was so special. And so, so anyway, I, went, I quit college, went back to DC, because I figured that's the safest place to start a business, and I knew politics. So by 1983 at 23, I'd opened my own appraisal and consulting business with the federal government as my client, thanks to one of the Congress wow. members in the United States Congress. So I started my business, and I was making several hundred thousand dollars a year. And uh, so I realized that I could do that. So and then I got the mayor of the city appointed me to chair the property tax appeal board, which was a very powerful board that heard all the tax appeals for the major properties in DC. And I'll never forget, there was this one developer, and his name was on almost all the buildings in downtown, all these construction sites, because DC was going, on, going through a renaissance, and the guy's name was Oliver T. Carr. So by the time I was on the board, I, I was conditioned to think of him as a god. I mean, no one, no normal person could do all this. And he showed up for an appeal. And I was so under-impressed in terms of his persona. So I said, man, he is a smart guy. And I had these conversations with him, and I said, well, he's smart, but he's not, you know, nuclear, you know, physics smart. So I can do what he does. Mm. And two years later, I was building my own, my first building. And so what happens is you got to alter your dreams, but the dreams have, and your goals have to be higher. They have to be realistically achievable but you're gonna need a lot of luck and good fortune to get there. So, I mean, so, okay, I didn't, by the way, and I did not get to $30 million by the time I was 30. I, did, I got a third of the way there. But had my dreams been to have a nice living or to make a half a million dollars or a million dollars by the time I was 30, I may have fallen short of that. And, but I did get to much more than a million a year by the time I was 40. And I clearly got much more, so I, I got beyond the 10x at 60. So you're saying, you're saying, even though you came up short, you would have come up short had the thinking been smaller. Absolutely, I would have come up much shorter. I would never, ever, ever be on this stage talking to someone like you, uh -huh. as accomplished as you are in an audience of such accomplished people, if it weren't for my ability to dream big. And I credit that with my mother. 
I mean, my mother told me that there was no limitation of what I could do. And I credit it to my grandparents, my janitor grandfather and my doorman grandfather. And my doorman grandfather gave me my first set of cufflinks. But both of them told me there was no limit to what I could accomplish. They were limited, but I wasn't. And, and, and so let's say some of these people are going home today and you're gonna, they're going to go home to people that might have some limited thinking. How would you, how would you, I think you're about the same age as me, right? I'm probably a bit older. I'm 61. I'm 63. Oh, wow. Okay, well, you, he's living a better life than me because he no. looks younger than I am. I would have bet you were in your 50s. No, I just go to the gym. Yeah, I need to as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... What would you tell them, what would you tell them that, like, regarding, you know, that, that right there, what you're, what you're speaking about? Like, how, how do they go back and deal with people maybe that want to put the brakes on it? First, first rule of great success is if you are not where you want to be now and you want to change that, you have to change the way you think. Because thinking the same way and expecting to get somewhere different is not going to happen. And they can be raw changes or they can be more specific changes. And I will never forget my mother who loved me to death and had great dreams of me, for me. Um, when I was 23 years old and the mayor of the city who I had built a relationship with by hosting candidate forums and some fundraisers for him, um, appointed me, offered me a seat on the property tax appeal board. And my mother said, don't do it because it's a hot seat and you're going to get scrutiny and you shouldn't do it. And she spent, I, I'd say, an hour talking me out of it. I ignored her advice. I said, you know what? She's not, I love her. Mm -hmm. She's a you know, person at that point in time I love more than anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. And she is not where I want to be. Mm -hmm. So R Wrong source of information, her, right? And, right, and she loved me. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I can't listen to her anymore. Right. And, uh, and then the next year, when there was an opportunity to become chairman and I navigated to do it, she said, don't do it. The best decision I'd ever made to do that. And I love her. I love to rest in peace. But you cannot listen to people and frankly, you can get advice like I got from my grandparents and from my, you know, my, my great-grandfather, but you can't take advice from naysayers because they're generally afraid. So your mom, your mom wanted to protect you at that point. Yes. She was being a mother. Right, and wanted to protect me from yeah. failure or scrutiny. But I'm a big boy, and, and, and look, I've been on the front. I mean, the one thing that she was afraid of happened to me when I did my first building. Um, the press taking a shot at me. So I did my first deal at 26 years old to build a major building in the city of Washington, D.C., and the mayor, my benefactor, was a, the, signed the lease that the government did to lease my building. I didn't do anything illegal, nothing improper, and I kick-started economic development and gave the, the city a good value. And so the Washington Post, though, the losing bidder, the, the hater, Went to the Washington Post said, there's this young black guy, never built a building before, and he's leasing, uh, he's going to build a big building and lease it to the city. And what he left out is that I was, you know, several hundred thousand dollars a year less than he was, and I partnered with a developer as capable, if not more capable than they were, and, but I was on the front page of the Washington Post and saying that the mayor had done me a favor. So next to the Iran-Contra affair and Ronald Reagan, there was a mayor, and I'll never forget I went in uh, that morning, I got people call, hey, man, I'm so sorry about that article, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like kind of getting a little sad about it. But then I went into this restaurant that I networked, because I, I went to the right restaurants to network with power people. I tipped the maitre d' so I got a power table, and I became powerful by visibility. Mm. And I went into that restaurant, and... Can, can, you, can you say that again for everybody again? Just the maitre d', the right table? Yeah. The most po the power lunch place that was always written about was a place called Joe and Moe's. And they mentioned who the owners were and so forth. So I went to lunch one time there when I had my benefactor, the mayor, wanted to have lunch. I said, let's have it at Joe and Moe's. Went there. I made sure I met the owner. 
I st and made sure he gave me his card so the next time I came, I could get there again. And he introduced me to the maitre d'. So from that point on, I just reinforced it. I went back the next few days later, and a few days after that, tipped the maitre d' and so forth. So I got the power seat in that restaurant. And then every now and then when I had lunch with the mayor, I'd bring him there, or a congressman, bring him there. And D.C. was a very political place. And so that made me have access to people. So I met the president of the, the chairman of, the, of the, one of the largest banks in the city. And that, and I'd be, he'd become a friend, and, I'd, and he invited me to the poker games. And so, and I'll never forget my first game, I lost $10,000, which was a very meaningful amount to me. And, uh, and he said, how long ago was that? And that was in uh, 1986. Yeah, that's, that's 30 and, grand. And he told me, well, you know, lessons aren't free. And, but anyway, so I walked into this restaurant, Washington Post out, and in fact, the Washington Post was sitting you know, in the bar because it was a political power place restaurant, so people were reading the Washington Post. And my, this chairman of the bank, who was 35 years or so older than I was, stood up, reached his hand out and said, welcome to the club. Wow. And he said, I bet you got, he said, I bet, he said, how much did you make, how, how much are you gonna make off that deal? I said, probably $10 million or so. He said, I bet you got a whole bunch of calls from your friends and people saying, hey, how, sorry about that article today, right? And I said, yeah, I did. He says, how many of them do you think would have just taken that article to make $10 million? You made $10 million. This is a one-day story. I'm throwing, the paper will get thrown in the trash, and people will move on to another issue, but you'll still have your $10 million. And from that moment on, I learned. Yeah, man, there's so many great takeaways here. Like, like you guys, you love this guy? Yeah. So transparent. I really appreciate you. Like, like, this is what I wanted as a kid. I wanted access to the information. I wanted access to, like, hey, man, connect, get the right table. Nobody told me to get the right table. Pay the maitre d'. I never knew that. You um, clearly, I mean, as I look around the world, I, I see, like, capital being a problem for people to, to access, okay? And... Women don't get access. Minorities don't get access. Can you just talk about how you've gotten access? Because you've gotten access to people and money. I mean, I built a persona. So every deal I did got, because of who I was as a minority, and I was doing it young, and I was political, I got coverage in the media every time. And I used to run from it. I decided to embrace it because it was being used as a weapon against me. So I had to neutralize it and I said, I make it an asset. So I was able to get access to good deals. That was what I worked on, good deals. And I felt that I could find the money for good deals. And I'll never forget, and I, lever and I believe in leverage too. I'll never forget there was a guy named Herbert Haft. He was like, he, a pharmacist, and then he built a chain called Dart Drugs, which was a foundation of CVS, basically. Mm. And he had Crown Books, Total um, Beverages, I mean, and was one of the largest shopping center owners in the country. And he told me, um, if you owe the bank $5 million, you can't sleep at night. If you owe them $50 million, why should you both be awake? And <laughs> That was back in the 1980s. And so I think it's, I mean, money will find um, good deals. Now, the challenge is if you are a woman, that you're gonna have a much harder time raising capital. If you are a minority, you're gonna have a much diff more difficult time of raising capital. If you are not one of the people in that elite class, no matter what your race or gender is, if you're starting off and you don't have money, you're going to have a tough time raising it as well. Um, you know, Bob Hope said, a banker is someone who wants to lend you money when you don't need it. That's right. And that is very true, by the way. So, so the biggest impediment is access to capital. For any of you all to grow your business, raise your hand if your biggest or amount of time that you spend is raising money or finding money for your deals. I can raise mine. It's the biggest challenge even today. So, so think about that. So there, the way real estate gets financed is you get debt financing from a senior bank, and then you get equity, either raising it from you know, individual investors or 
more efficiently on large deals like you, you, you raise it from private equity. So that Wall Street firms and so forth have private equity funds as well. And those private equity funds, their focus is making private real estate investments. And they raise money from institutional investors like public employee pension funds, union funds, and so forth, and individuals, wealthy individuals. Right now, as I sit here, there is $70 trillion of capital invested in venture capital and private equity. 70, now, how much? 70 trillion. trillion. Now, Biden just signed a legislation last week of $1.9 trillion to save the country. So think about 70 trillion. Of that 70 trillion dollars, less than 1.3% of it is invested in firms run or owned by women or people of color. That is a very unfair system. And by the way, the, 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 the white men who it's invested in are the ones way up here. So if you are not way up here, that capital is not accessible to you. Well, that's wrong because the biggest single class of investors in private equity are public employee retirement pension systems and union pension systems who are working men and women of who reflect the broad diversity of our country, and yet none of us can get access to that money. Well, I am working on changing that because I believe... And I need you all to help do it. This money, which would fuel entrepreneurship and bring our country to another level by empowering small business owners, aspiring entrepreneurs, and people who have part-time businesses, if they have fair access to capital. The reason why the top one-tenth of one percent owns half the country is they get 98.7% of all investment capital. They should own it all, frankly, given the disparity. But that is your money. It's your family's money. It's your parents' money. It is your friend's money. Because, because you're sending your money to retirement accounts. Yes. You want to explain? Yes, you're, because you, you, you are guys are participating money. in the crime here. Yes, you're sending your money to retirement accounts and not holding the custodians accountable. And by the way, most of the government employee funds are run by controllers and treasurers who are elected to their office, but not one of them ever talks about how they're going to deploy capital fairly and require these Wall Street firms. The California Public Employees Pension System just gave a company called Blackstone a $1 billion investment to invest in European real estate, not invest here to rebuild this country, but to take it to Europe and make money for them so that they can make another billion or two individually. And that has to stop. So I'm raising a fund for emerging developers and anyone interested in that can email fund at peoplescorp.com. Fund at peoplescorp.com. And we are raising our first fund to do business in seven cities in the U.S. to invest in small and first-time real estate investors and entrepreneurs early in their careers. And we're going to these pension funds and challenging them to do right by the rest of peop the people here, because there's no secret to my success other than what we've talked about. Any of you all can be sitting up here with the right opportunity, the willingness to work hard, some good luck, and fair access to capital. I know most of these people on Wall Street, many of them, many of them at the companies I talked about, they're no smarter than you. So, but they make hundreds of millions of but, dollars but they're doing, and but billions. They're do but they're doing something different. Yes. They got access. They got in the right rooms. They're playing the game. They're sitting at the right table. 
like you guys, you got to quit using, like you're saving money with a bank that didn't lends the money out and you have no control over the lend out. You do have control over putting money in the bank. Where should people be putting money today? I know you love real estate. They, I mean, real estate is the place right now and it always is. It outpaces inflation. Um, and you can I'll give you an example I, of, 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 of a simplistic, straight formula to real estate wealth. Buy your first property or invest in your first deal. Then multiply it, invest in your second deal. Always income producing properties. Then say that one more time, please. Always income producing property. Cash flow. Because cash flow, your money will work harder for you than you can. And two, because this great concentration of wealth that I just discussed, they've rigged the tax system for us. So real estate, you get all kinds of tax protections too. And when you sell, you pay a much lower tax rate than an ordinary income generating asset. You also get depreciation and other benefits, but you do, you invest in real estate, and then at a certain point, some people will want to go into development. And my, by the way, the nice thing about real, investing in real estate and income producing properties is you can continue to do other things to make money and make real estate a part of your portfolio. And where you can build wealth through real estate while you're working on someplace else to produce cash. And you build that up, but you've got to be disciplined and keep investing, keep investing. And those of you all who want to go into development, work on a house first. Sell that. Then work on a multi, small multifamily. Then a bigger one. Then a bigger one. Then a bigger one. And, bi and then stop selling. Stop what? Selling. Keep, Own, hold it. Keep cash flow. And if you get yourself on a 10-year plan, mm -hmm. by the time you go out 10 years, you, could, you should own at least 10 buildings. They should all be producing income and you will make far more money than anything else. Magic Johnson told me once, he made much more money. He's a, he, he invested in a real estate fund and started one. He told me he made much more money in real estate in five years than he made in totality playing in the NBA. So, so, so over the next 10 years, what, what, do you, what, what real estate class do you like? I know you're building a huge building in, in LA, right? The tallest building in LA. But how do you like apartments? What do you think about office? And what do you think about retail? Well, I'm an opportunistic player. And that's what development is, meaning trying to create value. So I like um, apartment buildings and, because they're cash flow. And first of all, I think you got to look at real estate as a, supply, a simple business, supply and demand. Simple. So you want to provide. And by the way, if supply outpaces demand, prices go down. If, if demand outpaces supply, prices go up. Simple as that. And you want to sell when fewer people are selling and buy when fewer people are buying. Now, you can't be active in the business by saying, I'm, I'm going to apply that rule to one city. So you got to invest on a national platform and pursue opportunities. So what do people need the most? What, can, what do we know that technology will not take away in our lifetime? It's certainly... Housing and homes, we got to rest our heads somewhere. And also, frankly, the last I checked, we cannot take a virtual vacation to the Bahamas. We actually got to go there to get a suntan. We got to go there to swim in the ocean. So we need a place to put our head down, hotels. So the top two places I like are hotels. I think office buildings present a tremendous opportunity because no one knows where they're going now because that business was getting disrupted before COVID, but COVID gave the world a crash course on virtual work and remote working. So offices are not gonna be consumed the way they have been in the past. There's gonna be a declining demand for office space. So that means there's great opportunity. Buy office buildings. And also development is shut down right now in most places. Buy land. I mean, but you wanna be opportunistic, but protect yourself with cash flow producing long-term demand assets that will never, ever go out of favor. If you run an apartment building well, like what you guys do, yeah. you'll never, ever be out of business in that building. There's always a demand for it. Even through COVID, we had 98% we had collections despite what the paper said. 
Why, why, why does the newspaper, the media, always go so negative? Well, first of all, let's think, Katrina and I were talking about this yesterday because I'm getting tired of reading some of this stuff, right? First of all, when I grew up, there were three networks, CBS, ABC, and NBC, one local station, and public broadcasting. That was it, and, they turned, and, the new, and the TV programming stopped at midnight, and on the weekends it ran to two o'clock, right? And I got to watch a midnight special with um, Wolfgang Jack for concerts. Then cable television came about in the 1980s, and then all these channels grew and grew. So there are now hundreds and hundreds of, of channels, Me communication through our phone, which we never thought would happen before. Um, you've got communication all across the board in terms of online, so there's a need for content. And as Katrina pointed out to me, because I said, why do they print this junk? Or why are they publishing this stuff? And she said, because you've got to grab somebody's attention. That's right. Because there's an, another several thousand news sources or outlets. So the media is looking for sensationalism. And, and that is why they're so negative. But go against the herd mentality. That's how you make money. If it were as simple as following what, uh, by the way, my favorite, uh, favorite speech is, um, is, is uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Man in the Arena. So in summary, it's easy for the critic to attack and to criticize the doer, but it is far better to go out into the world and try to achieve greatness as opposed to sitting on your ass and being a critic. And I hope there are not a lot of journalists in here, but they tend to be the ass-sitting critics. And ultimately, my mother told me something, and I disagree with her, by the way, is that those who do do those who can't teach. I believe teachers are one of my, our most valuable resources, but I will say this, those who do do those who don't become writers for publications. They're the critics. <laughs> That's hilarious. I've heard you say that before you were a real estate man and before you were a businessman, you were a black man. And what is it that, that people that look like me might not understand about the black community that we need to understand better? And what is it people in the community need to do to level their game up? So I think, look, First of all, we are in a meritocracy. I believe everybody deserves a fair chance. And everybody gets to where they're gonna get to in this day and age based on their abilities and their hard work and good fortune. And some of us, though, will have a harder time. I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward that we can all agree that women have a much harder time than my gender um, to go out and compete in the world, say, that I operate in. Because if it weren't the case, it would be more than 1% of the top executives in the commercial real estate industry being female. So, but when you look, when you think about African Americans, I think it's important to understand our country's history. And so, if we go back a second, just think about that African Americans did not come here willingly. They were kidnapped. Uh, my ancestors were kidnapped and brought to this country and provided free labor under horrific conditions for 249 years. So this country, the foundation of this democracy, was built based upon free labor. And then another 150 years of absurd discrimination and oppression. And then we went into this next phase of trying to right a wrong that kept, took place for over 400 years, which is impossible to do, by the way. And so, we, we have this challenge where obviously people are very frustrated because of the lack of opportunity. But think about the very foundation that we get from our ancestors. The values, the values I got from my grandparents. Those values are absent to many of us because of what society did. So we have free labor while other people were getting to build their skill set, their value system, their family structure, all of which were taken away. So to say today that we're all equal is 
disingenuous because it's like saying we're going to run the Indianapolis 500 and there are three sets of drivers. There's white men, their driver A. There are women, their driver B. And they're African Americans, driver C. They're all in Ferraris. They all have equal credentials. However, driver A starts off on lap 450. Driver B starts off on lap 200. And driver C, African Americans, start off on lap one. And then to say, okay, may the best driver win. Now, the only way that driver C wins is if driver A and driver B crash and burn. It's mathematically impossible. So, therefore, we have to say, how do we adjust this without diminishing driver A's skill set? an opportunity, which driver A worked just as hard as driver B and C to get educated and to get skilled and so forth, right? Everybody worked the same. So how do we level the playing field? One of the ways that I know is to say, because also the challenge now is that driver A is also now disadvantaged because of a concentration of wealth. Wealth concentration has produced severe disadvantages for all Americans. So how do we change that? One way I know is to change access to capital and access to opportunity. So we all have to look at people the same and judge them based on qualifications. It does no one a service to say, I'm going to hire Don Peebles because he's black instead of hiring Grant, and Grant's better at this. You should hire me because I'm good or better, right? But at the same hand, we've got to level the playing field so we both have equal access to capital and equal access to opportunity. And when the banks evaluate us to make loans to us, they evaluate us the same. So that can be done through a business, but mainly a political process. Because as rich as Jeff Bezos is, he's got one vote, one. Grant and Hamilton don't vote, they're dead. So we all are equal there. So there's power in our numbers. And if we want to level this playing field and be united on leveling the playing field for all of us, then we can see cha things change. And that's really what we have to do, be fair and equitable. And until, until the politicians get their, get their act together, Don and Grant, people of different looks, start working together, start doing projects together. I'll bet you Don and I could do something quicker together as a deal, and you guys could work with us. And, and if you find people of other colors that are qualified, that are in the car, that want to race, that want to take the risk, okay? I encourage everybody here to seek those relationships, okay? And don't discriminate against a female or a person of different background. I reached out to Don today because I wanted you to hear his story. This is the American success story. And I want to do some business with this guy. Give him a big hand. Come on. Give him a 10X. Thank you. A big one. Bobby. Hit him up.